Okay. Yes, let's get started. It's very quiet today here. Okay. So we've covered a lot on computation and memory, and there is more to cover. Since this is such an important topic, we're going to spend today on that topic as well. Uh, I have a PhD defense to attend at right after 3 p.m., so we're going to end the lecture a bit early today. Okay. So remember, this is where we left off. We were talking about 3D, exploiting 3D stack memory uh, for processing in memory. Is this better? Okay. I felt like I was hearing my voice. And we're going to continue that, and we're going to see some more examples. And then we're going to talk about adoption issues and then conclude. Feel free to ask questions or bring ideas at this point, because this is an area where we really need a lot more research, a lot more ideas, and there, there are really a huge wealth of problems as well as solution directions to follow. Okay, so these were the two questions we asked. Uh, what is the maximal thing that you can do uh, with 3D stacked memory? And what is the minimal thing that you can do with 3D stacked memory if you want to do, put processing inside the 3D stack uh, system? And we answered, or we looked at one example answer to that question, right? If we could have the freedom to change the entire system, including the programming model, coherence mechanisms, virtual memory, actually we got rid of virtual memory in that case, uh, to take advantage of the logic layer in 3D stack memory, what would you do? And we talk about the Tesseract paper, which hopefully you remember uh, from yesterday. I'm not going to talk about that again uh, today. But there, I think this is a very good direction, and there could be a lot of other uh, workloads that could be accelerated this way. Even though this paper specifically focuses on graph processing, which is an important workload, it's by no means restricted to graph processing, because you know now that the processors that we put into the vaults of the logic layer are actually general purpose embedded cores. So you could actually execute anything there. If you want to actually execute uh, specialize the logic layer more, maybe you want to have reconfigurability in the logic layer. You may want to add reconfigurable logic over there, and then that reconfigurable logic can be configured depending on the workload that's executing or that's being offloaded uh, to, uh, to the logic layer. I, I actually think that's a very good direction. Uh, having some partial reconfigurability in the logic layer is a good idea because you may want to have cores, clearly, but you may also want to configure the logic layer to execute uh, the real bottleneck parts of your program uh, that are bottleneck by memory. And we're going to see some more examples of this in a little bit. Okay, any questions on Tesseract or this sort of system design? Is it interesting? Okay. And the numbers you get out of this is really large, I think, in terms of both performance and energy reductions. Especially if you apply the optimization techniques that other people have proposed since the publication of this paper in 2015. So it's easy to get two orders of magnitude performance improvement and more than one order of magnitude energy improvement. Okay, so now let's uh, not be as aggressive. Let's try to uh, do something simple or simpler uh, to still gain benefits from uh, executing programs in the logic layer without a lot of costs. So Tesseract clearly has costs. We looked at the advantages and disadvantages. Changing the entire system always has costs, right? But can we do something uh, less costly and still get some benefits? And that's the, that's the next question that we're going to look at. And the idea over here is, as opposed to designing a complete accelerator for a single application and changing everything in the system, can we still keep CPU and uh, processing in memory and somehow find out functions in an application that's executing on the CPU and offload them to the processing in memory engine? such that those functions hopefully benefit a lot from being processed close to memory in the logic layer, and overall application benefits significantly. Does that make sense? It's very simple function offloading, basically. Of course, somebody needs to do the function offloading. Somebody needs to go and mark these functions are probably good, suitable for executing and processing in memory in the logic layer, and I would benefit a lot. So who, who, who could that be? Of course, it could be the programmer. It could be the compiler, as we discussed yesterday, and we also discussed that if programmer does it, maybe they write, write their programs also in a way where they could actually gather together these uh, operations that would benefit a lot uh, from being executed close to memory. If the compiler does it, it may not be able to have that kind of freedom because it may not be able to analyze the program perfectly 
uh, globally, right? And clearly the programmer has semantic information about their program so they can, uh, they can partition their programs potentially better. But that's up, up for debate also, right? Programmer, if they know the program, they can optimize it. But compiler can still do optimizations on top of that. I believe in the end the best answer is probably both of them working together in some way. Okay, so let's take a look at this function offloading approach. And I'm going to talk about this paper that I mentioned a couple of times in the past, uh, uh, past, few, past few lectures, actually. And this is work that uh, we have done together with Google. Uh, my student, Amirali, spent some time at Google as an intern. And I also spent as a visiting researcher at Google. And we worked on understanding uh, the uh, workloads, important workloads that people execute in consumer devices like an Android phone or a Chromebook. Uh, mobile devices essentially and we wanted to understand the bottlenecks in these devices especially data movement related memory related bottlenecks and we wanted to understand the potential of processing in memory to actually mitigate some of these bottlenecks and our goal was uh, more practical basically can we actually uh, reduce the energy consumption significantly in these devices by taking advantage of 3D stacked memories and processing in memory and clearly these devices are everywhere right and they're going to become more important and you could expand these to other devices that are not necessarily used by people, right? but devices that are out there collecting data and doing stuff. And these were the workloads that uh, we wanted to focus on because th these are workloads that are actually used in many such devices. There are examples, even if you're not using Android phones, for example, you may be using some other browser, not Chrome, right? Uh, but uh, basically, we wanted to look at web browsing, which is used by pretty much everyone who uses mobile systems. TensorFlow Mobile, which is the machine learning framework that's used in uh, at least at, at Google, but there are machine learning frameworks that are used by any company. And if you don't know that these are doing machine learning while you're using them or not using them, you should probably know that. They may be collecting data about you also. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> it's interesting that when uh, uh, this thing targets some of the ads based on what you're talking about. I think. I don't know how, 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 how they can get away with that sort of privacy violations, but. That, that sort of thing happens, I think. If that doesn't happen to you, let me know what your settings are. <laughs> okay, but basically these things are deployed everywhere, uh, whether you know or you don't know, or you intentionally use or you intentionally don't use them. And clearly video is, a, is an application that everybody uses, right, today, video playback and capture. And these actually uh, are, are not just mobile workloads. And we, we were looking at mobile versions of it, but these workloads actually exist on the server side as well, right? Clearly, you, in the data centers, you do a lot of machine learning. And also, uh, there's a server side component of the video processing uh, and, and playback as well. Okay, so what we wanted to understand was the energy cost of data movement in these devices. And data movement occurs uh, from the memory system into the CPU. And there's a lot of data movement that happens. And we wanted to quantify that data moment. So our first key observation in this paper was how do we quantify that data moment? And if you read the paper, you will see the methodology. But the takeaway is, after doing experiments on, on devices and simulators, we found out that more than 60% 60, 60 of the total system energy in a Chromebook-like device is spent on data moments between the memory and the CPU. That's a lot, basically. You're wasting... Assume, assuming that you eliminate all of that data moment, you're actually... Uh, uh, you would actually uh, uh, increase your energy efficiency by 2x, right? Okay, so potential solution we examined, as I said, is can we actually eliminate that data moment as much as possible by moving computation close to data? And the challenge, of course, in these devices, especially in these devices, and uh, even more, there are even more stringent devices that are out there in the field, are is limited area and energy budget. So you're, you're, not, you're limited as to what you can do in the compute unit because you don't want to increase your energy while offloading uh, computation in that compute unit, right? And we wanted to be very cognizant of this uh, because we really wanted to develop practical mechanisms. And uh, the second key observation, uh, so, and we wanted to do function offloading, as I said. You don't want to redesign the entire system. We want to actually find functions that would benefit from being executed over here such that we can minimize data moment. Okay, you could actually... Uh, potentially formulate this problem theoretically and give it to a compiler and compiler figures out how to do it, right? Of course, you need to f figure out how to enable the compiler to do it, but it's, it's not an easy problem in the end. But actually, I, I will later reference a paper that we worked on before this that does it at the compile time. Uh, 
on a GPU. We will talk about that. But the results in this paper are slightly better, I think, uh, because we, we didn't actually rely on the compiler. Here, the programmer, meaning my student, Amir Ali, was the person who actually went ahead and figured out what functions should be offloaded uh, to the compute unit. And the second key observation, once you start looking at and ex uh, understanding and examining these applications, is that data movement actually comes, often comes from very simple functions. And I'll give you some examples of these simple functions uh, in a little bit. Which means that you can hopefully design lightweight logic, simple cores, or simple accelerators to execute these simple functions in, in the on the memory side, in the logic layer. We'll see some of these functions, as I said. So you could, these functions could be executed in very small, low-power embedded cores, like very simple ARM cores, potentially, or very small fixed-function accelerators right, that are specialized to um, doing these functions, like me memory copy could be one function. right? Or memory zeroing could be another function. Compression, decompression, as we will see, are other functions. So you could actually design specialized accelerators. As I said, I think lo having logic layer that is partially composed of cores and partially composed of reconfigurable logic is a good idea because these functions may be different across applications. And whenever you actually instantiate an application, uh, you may actually reconfigure that logic layer so that uh, some important function uh, can can be executed over there in, 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 uh, very efficiently. I think some, some really important functions could be over there as really fixed accelerators without reconfigurable, more like ASIC style accelerators, right? Uh, like mm, special purpose accelerators and that are not reconfigurable. Like I think memory copying is done by many, many applications, so you can actually instantiate those as, uh, uh, as, as fixed, uh, fixed non-reconfigurable accelerators. Okay, so and the takeaway in the in this paper is that offloading the functions that we find out uh, to the PIM logic or processing in memory accelerators reduces energy and improves performance by around two x basically. So this fifty five percent, if uh, it's not phrased very well over here, but basically the takeaway is you improve performance and improve energy at the same time by two, by each each by two x. So it's not a bad result, I think, but it's clearly not the 13.8x that we saw yesterday, right? And as I uh, as I mentioned, that 13.8x is actually improved by others. Although maybe that's not a fair comparison because if somebody may take this work and improve it further, and maybe they, they will also increase it to 4x or something. But two two versus 13.8x are different. But clearly, we're not redesigning the entire system also here. So let's take a look at some of these workloads. I think it's all, always important to understand your workloads if you want to partition your workload between different types of computation units, whether it's a CPU, GPU, or CPU, FPGA, or a combination of those. You really need to understand your workload, right? In this case, the heterogeneous execution environment is CPU plus processing and memory engines, right? And uh, let's understand some of these workloads. I think I'll start with this one because this happens to be the hype today, in a sense, right? These machine learning frameworks out there, people are using them, uh, and people are relying on them on many things. Uh, whether or not they're doing really good things is, remains to be seen, I think, but the technology is there, I think. Uh, basically, uh, we wanted to look at uh, what's usually done in mobile devices. In mobile devices, uh, essentially, you train a network, and you put the network inside the uh, device, and basically, you, uh, you give inputs to the network, and uh, the, the network provides a prediction based on the inputs. For example, some classification task, right? It could be a, it could be a word recognition task. You provide some word, and uh, the, the network gives you what that word is, right, when you speak. Or you provide some image, and the network figures out whether you have a cat or a dog in it, or a horse in it. I don't know, what, whatever you want to see. It may be wrong, of course, right? <laughs> but basically, uh, today, uh, th this task is done by deep neural networks in general, or convolutional neural networks. And these consist of multiple layers. And if you've taken my course on systolic arrays uh, in digital circuits, you probably remember that. Is anybody from digital circuits here? I guess not yet. <laughs> OK. I'm not going to go into the details of it. Has, uh, have people seen deep neural networks in some courses? Okay, so I'm not going to go through that. That's, that's good. We could talk about it. but uh, and, and clearly, uh, there are many layers in these networks today. Uh, and there's a lot of computation uh, that happens in each layer. Uh, usually, it's matrix sort of computation. 
uh, and we're going to talk about that briefly later as well. But basically, we analyze this, these workloads on real networks, multiple real networks that people use for inference today, and we find out that more than 50% of the energy, inference energy, is spent on data movements. Basically, even though there's a lot of computation that goes on in terms of matrix uh, operations inside the network, still more than 50% of the energy is spent on moving data. And we wanted to understand why that is the case, basically. And it turns out, uh, more than 50% of that data movement actually comes from simple operations like packing and unpacking of the data or quantization of the data. And these are techniques that are employed by all kinds of neural networks. And let's take a look at what these two are. So packing and unpacking, basically, uh, when you move from layer to layer, you reorganize the data such that the data is ready to be processed by the next layer in the network. That's the idea. Um, it's called packing or unpacking. I guess basically, basically what you do is you really reorder the elements of the matrices to minimize uh, or maximize computation efficiency and also minimize cache misses if you use a cache and a CPU during matrix multiplication. That's the idea. Uh, and it turns out this is actually a relatively simple operation uh, that uh, that really reorganizes the data. It's really a data re reorganization operation. You don't, you're not doing a lot of computation. You're, you're really not doing computation on the data. You're really rearranging what the data looks like so that you get good cache locality. And at the same time, because you get good cache, cache locality, you get high parallelism because you're getting all of the data elements that you are going to operate on at the same time. Right? So it really achieves multiple purposes, that, that data reorganization that you do. And you usually do it when you move from one layer to another layer. Now, it's true that you don't do it every time you move from between layers in a network. If you have a 100-layer network, for example, you don't, you don't necessarily do it at every layer. But you do it maybe uh, when you change uh, from a convolutional layer to some other layer, potentially. Anyway, this depends on the network, clearly. That's why I'm not going to go into the details, but the paper has more details. But it turns out this packing and unpacking actually leads to significant energy uh, cost. So up to 40% of the inference energy and 31% of the inference execution time is spent on packing. And the data movement that's uh, caused by packing actually accounts for a significant fraction of the inference energy, as you see. This is the average across multiple networks, I believe five or six networks. And as I said, this is, you're really not doing a lot of operations on the data, you're really just rearranging it, which means that you're really doing just simple arithmetic. Basically, you're taking the coordinates of a matrix element and you're remapping it to some other coordinates. You're transposing, for example, a row to become a column because the data processing that you do in some other layer requires the data to be uh, mapped in column order as opposed to row order. Does that make sense? That's, that's the idea. It really depends on what you're doing in a layer. So, because of this, uh, this is actually really easy to offload uh, to uh, to, to a logic layer. Uh, compare this to matrix multiplication itself, right? If you're doing matrix multiplication itself, and if you have very good locality, you should really not be uh, uh, doing a lot of data moments. You just bring the matrices into the caches, and you just do multiplication, and you have a lot of operations in the matrix multiplication, right? Especially if you have a dense matrix where you really need to multiply many elements. Okay, so that's one example. The other example is quantization. But by the way, is this clear? Okay. And this is, I think, not just necessarily true for uh, neural networks, but if you're doing a lot of matrix operations uh, in scientific computing, for example, uh, and, and you do a lot of those matrix operations, for example, when you do climate modeling, weather prediction, I think you run into a very similar problem. Because you need to operate on data in some way, uh, sometime, and then when you want to operate on data in some other way, you need to reorganize your data. And that leads to a lot of movement, and that reorganization operation can be offloaded to processing in memory. So you can imagine, not just this, this, is, this is a function that's not uh, limited to an important application like machine learning, but it's, it's actually uh, seen in many, many other applications. In the end, it's really uh, how you lay out your data affects your computation effectiveness and computation efficiency, and sometimes you really want to reorganize your data. I like thinking of this as whenever you're multiplying matrix A and B, for example, you really need to go through matrix A in, uh, in, in row order. You, because you basically take one row from A and then one column from B, and then you do the multiplication. But if, if you're multiplying, like, uh, um, if, if you need to multiply in some other order, 
Like if you need to have A as in the other part of the multiplication, now you need to go through A in the column order, right? Which means that you need to reorganize your data because once you go, if, you, if, it's, if it's laid out in row order, when you go and traverse that matrix in column order, you'll get a lot of cache misses. Make sense, hopefully. Okay. Okay. So the second operation is quantization. This is actually employed in pretty much all networks that I know of, especially well, during inference, because people have found out, as we discussed last time actually, uh, you don't really need very large values or weights uh, or features, uh, 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 data representations in the end data types to get good accuracy out of these networks. You have 32-bit floating point value, but you don't really need all that precision. You can actually convert this 32-bit floating point value, like a sample or a weight, to an 8-bit integer, and basically you don't lose any accuracy. Actually, sometimes your accuracy improves when, actually, when, you, when you quantize, which is interesting, uh, because there's, 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 a lot, there's a large parameter space in the network, and there's noise, there's a lot of noise tolerance, and uh, for, for that reason your accuracy might improve also. But that's not the common case. The common case is uh, you don't lose accuracy, but you gain a lot of energy efficiency because you're not operating on these huge data, type, data elements. You're operating on much smaller integers. And uh, as, uh, also, the format is much simpler, right? An integer addition is much simpler than a floating point addition because you really need to don't, you, you don't need to deal with the mantissa and the exponent of a floating point number. Clearly, so this is done pretty much in uh, any, uh, pretty much in any uh, network and uh, inference engine, and that leads to significant execution time, energy uh, uh, consumption reductions. And actually, as, as we discussed last time, uh, yesterday, people are trying to reduce this and make it configurable. Right? Sometimes, if you find out two-bit integers is enough, why don't you use two-bit integers? And binary neural networks try to represent each sample or weight with a single bit. But as you, of course, reduce uh, the, the size of your integer, your accuracy starts dropping. People find out that 8 bits is pretty good. I think this is empirical findings, of course. But as you drop to 4 bits, you lose actually some accuracy, but you still gain execution time and energy. And you, that may be a good trade-off depending on the environment you're operating in. Right? If you're in a really energy-constrained environment, maybe you, you can tolerate some accuracy loss, but you, you, you survive much longer. Right? You can still make some right decisions even though accuracy loss uh, is there. Right? But people, people also find out that binarized neural networks are actually not as accurate. Once you go to one bit, you lose a lot of accuracy. There are some applications where they're still accurate, but it's not the common case at this point. And of course, your training uh, ch may change depending on your quantization levels. So if your quantization level uh, is a single bit, you may actually need to retrain your network to actually get much higher accuracies. And people actually play a lot of those tricks if they know that they're going to execute the uh, inference with a single bit integer in the weights, they may actually go back and retrain their network in some other way. But of course, training, we're not talking about training in this case. Right? Okay, so clearly quantization has a lot of benefits, but if you think about quantization, it's, it's a simple data conversion operation in this case, right? Well, it's before that. Uh, this is what we found out in the workloads that we examined. It's not as significant as uh, packing and unpacking, but it's still significant. It's 16, up to 16% uh, percent of the energy and execution time spent doing quantization. And the majority of quantization energy actually comes from data woman. You bring the data and you chop off some bits, basically. It's a very simple data conversion operation. Uh, and of course, you need to do some shifting addition multiplication, depending on how you do the conversion, but it's, it's not as significant. Okay. So uh, let's take a uh, look at the results first. Any questions on quantization? Okay. How many of you have worked uh, with neural networks? Okay, that's a good chunk. What were the uh, val uh, what was the precision level of the integers that you were working with? Do you remember? Eight bit. Eight bit. Yeah, eight bit is the common case I think today in in many devices. I think people are trying to reduce that to four bits, for sure. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at what happens if you actually offload these operations uh, into memory. So I'll, we're going to focus on this one. Uh, into, uh, and we're going to focus on two examples. This is a CPU-only execu uh, energy in this case. And it's nor uh, this is normalized to CPU-only execution. Now if you offload packing uh, to PIM core, you basically reduce the, halve the energy essentially reduce the energy by 50%, right? 
which is pretty significant. And if you actually design a specialized accelerator for packing, as opposed to having a small embedded low power core, you reduce the energy a bit more because accelerator is clearly more efficient. It doesn't need to go through the instruction cycle uh, to do the operations. And if you, if you look at quantization, you get very similar results. Here, the accelerator seems to be a little bit better. So basically, there, the takeaway is there's significant energy gains uh, that you can get uh, by finding these functions and offloading them to uh, 3D stack memory. And uh, we're going to look at Chrome browser a little bit more, but you can see that there are similar functions in the Chrome browser. For example, compression and decompression. They're not just limited to the Chrome browser, clearly. They can be used by any application if you have some compression uh, accelerator that you have on the memory side or decompression accelerator that you have on the memory side. You can compress, for example, pages. This could be useful for the operating system. If you're running out of memory, for example, the me uh, operating system can call this me in memory function and say, please compress some pages for me. And memory handles them, handles that compression internally, such that it doesn't really occupy the CPU and you, you gain uh, memory space, right? That's certainly possible to do. Today, if you want to compress some pages, uh, what happens is you bring the page, just like what we've seen uh, in, in page copy, you have to bring the page into the processor and the processor does the compression uh, and then processor has to write the compressed page back as well as the metadata back. Wouldn't it be nice if the memory just did it without having the processor in, uh, being involved? That's the idea. Of course, processor needs to maintain metadata, so it, it needs to set up uh, the compression and decompression, but it can offload the uh, heavy task of uh, running the compression algorithm or de decompression algorithm to the memory itself. And you can see that there are some other examples over here, which we will briefly talk about. Uh, and if you look at video playback and capture, there are similar examples over here. You don't need to know exactly what they are. You can read the paper for more detail. But motion estimation, this, for example, it's very heavily used by all video engines. You basically try to estimate uh, how the frames have changed, right? How an object has moved between two different frames or multiple different frames. And you can see that uh, if you offload this uh, to a PIM core, you improve uh, energy by 40%. It turns out the accelerator is very, very efficient over here. It buys you a lot more energy efficiency because this is actually a relatively complex operation. Uh, you're, you're really trying to figure out how things are moving in a, in a, in a frame. <coughs> Okay, so what's the takeaway? Basically, uh, energy consumption on average reduces by around 49% if you use a general purpose core on the PIM side, processing in, on the, uh, through a logic layer side. And it improves even more if you actually use a specialized accelerator for these functions. But clearly, these functions may increase, right, if you add more applications. That's why I think having a reconfigurable logic layer that you can reconfigure uh, to be an accelerator whenever you need these functions could be very useful. Okay, so this is energy. Uh, per on the performance side, the story is similar. Uh, as you can see, here the accelerators actually um, uh, provide even more benefit. Oh, okay, this is the TensorFlow mobile. So in this case, we looked at both applications, uh, bo bo both of these at the same time, packing and quantization. And you can see that uh, runtime reduces again by uh, around 50%. This is normalized execution time. And if you reduce the execution time by 50%, that means that you're really improving performance by 2x. Right. That's the. Uh, whenever you want to write a paper, it's better to write 2x. <laughs> In this paper, we weren't very strategic. We just said this for 54% reduction execution time. But really, you're halving the execution time, right? If you think about it that way, which means that you're doubling the performance. Okay. But still, this paper was accepted. That's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions? I mean, I don't want to go through all of these one by one, but you can see that compression and decompression also gain significantly. And actually, all of these gain significantly. Maybe some of these are harder uh, to, to get performance on because there are a lot of dependent operations uh, that happen in these interpolation and deblocking filter, whereas some of these other ones don't have a lot of dependent operations uh, between uh, different instructions. Okay, so let's take a look at one more workload, uh, unless, unless someone wants to keep talking about machine learning. Okay. okay, let's take a look at Chrome. I like this one also. Well, clearly every, everything is very interesting, but we don't have time to cover everything. Chrome is very interesting because uh, it's, it's a browser, and we wanted to look at the bottlenecks in this browser. And this is how the browser actually renders a web page. I'll go through this very briefly. You get some HTML and CSS, and you parse them. Uh, okay, I don't know what's happening here. Basically, you 
have some loading and parsing. This is some fancy animation that I don't like, but Amira likes it. <laughs> uh, and you, you do some layouting of the page. Basically, you need to calculate the visual elements and position of each object so that you can display it on the screen. And then you do some rasterization, you paint those objects and generate the bitmaps. And in the end, you do compositing, which assembles all the layers that you created over here into a final screen image. So it's a long pipeline. And we're going to look at the bottlenecks of those pipelines. So essentially, uh, there are three things that are important for users. Maybe there are more than three, but we, we focused on three. Right? Uh, you, need to have, you need to load the pages, and that needs to be fast. I guess whenever this is slow, which is the, usually the case for me, <laughs> it's, it's a quality of service problem, right? It's a predictable performance problem in the end. And when you scroll, you don't want, to be, you don't want your user experience to uh, get destroyed. And sometimes this gets stuck when you're scrolling. That happens. Usually it runs out of memory, actually. <laughs> That's one of the reasons. Uh, and, and also, if you, if, you, if you use a lot of tabs like I do, if you have like 50 tabs, uh, or 100 tabs, or 300 tabs in your Chrome, and I've seen people who use 300 tabs. I don't know how many, how many you, you all use, but <laughs> 300 is possible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but when you switch between the tabs, again, your user experience is important, right? You, you really need to, uh, that, you want that to be quick. And we, want, we looked at all of these cases, actually. Uh, but we focused mainly on page scrolling and tab switching, because both of them actually include the page loading, right? Whenever you switch between the tabs, you need, need to load. So let's take a look at tab switching a little bit. What happens during tab switching? So basically, in Chrome, Chrome architecture is a multi-process architecture. So each tab is really a separate process in this case. Of course, there are different approaches to designing a web browser. They don't have to be separate processes. Right? They can be separate threads in the same process. But Chrome uses a separate process. And they argue that this is for security, but that's debatable in the end. right? Uh, so there are main operations. the main operations during tab switching is you really context switch between this process and uh, to another process, and you need to load the page that's in that tab. And it turns out, if you have a lot of tabs, you're consuming a lot of memory. Uh, how fast a new tab loads is important and becomes interactive is important and memory consumption is also important. So the number of tabs you can support is really limited by your memory in the end. And Chrome uh, realizes that and it uses compression to reduce each tab's memory footprint. Basically if a tab is deemed inactive by some metric from the web browser, and you can imagine what kind of metrics could be employed, right? If a tab has not been switched into for some time, maybe you deem it inact inactive. You keep track of it, right, in the software. Then uh, what the, what the uh, what Chrome does is basically it 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 compresses it and uh, writes it into DRAM in a compressed way uh, in an area of memory called ZRAM, I guess compressed RAM. And if you actually go to a tab that's compressed in memory, you need to decompress it clearly. And that really affects your user experience here, right? Actually, both of them affect your user experience. Whenever you're compressing, you're probably writing a lot of data into memory, and you're actually potentially delaying some other things. But uh, this is really on the critical path of user uh, satisfaction, in a sense. Whenever you're uh, switched to a new tab, and if it's compressed, you need to decompress it very quickly. That's the idea. So we did a, a study of data movement that's caused by uh, uh, tab switching. And we've done multiple studies, but we decided we use 50 tabs. Of course, the problem becomes worse as you increase the number of tabs. The problem becomes less as you reduce the number of tabs. And we found out that actually more, uh, uh, about 18% of the total system energy, this is total system energy, is spent on compression and decompression, which is significant, I think. And a lot of data actually moves between the CPU and the ZRAM. And of course, this depends on what's inside the tabs, you can actually, uh, there, there, there are a lot, these are all input dependent parameters. Uh, but we, we looked at some cases where we thought was representative. Okay, then the quick key question is can you use PIM to mitigate the cost? And the idea is uh, relatively simple. If you actually look at the execution time and if you're executing everything in the CPU, let's assume that Chrome decides to swap out n pages at a given time because you're creating more tabs and uh, uh, you're creating more tabs and you need more memory, essentially. And it decides that these M pages should be compressed. What it does is it basically asks the memory, memory, give me all of those uncompressed pages. So it reads those M pages, it compresses them and writes them back to memory. Right. And all of this is done in the CPU, clearly. This is the compression path. 
and then it can move to other tasks, right? Assuming this is single threaded. Imagine that the single threaded for the purpose of illustration. Of course, if you have multi threads, then you can overlap some of these things, but okay. So clearly this causes very high data movement between memory and CRAM depending on your page size and depending on number n over here. So the key idea of offloading compression uh, to uh, main memory is uh, while you're swapping out the m pages, you basically do all of that compression inside memory. Because uncompressed pages are already in memory, you do the compression inside the memory and you write it back to some other location in memory including the metadata. Of course you need to add this compression logic to the logic layer now. And Essentially, you don't cause any off-chip data movement because of these pages. Right. That's the idea. And also, assuming you have a single thread, you can start other tasks much earlier while the memory is doing uh, compression. So it's very simple, but I think the benefits are significant because you both improve energy efficiency. You get rid of data movement for this case, for this part. You both improve energy efficiency and improve performance. Keep that performance always with uh, a grain of salt because your performance could have improved anyway if you had multiple threads, right? But that requires multiple threads, which means that you need multiple cores to be active. That's also not good for energy efficiency necessarily. Right? Keep that in mind. Before, uh, a couple of lectures ago when we started processing in memory, I said you can always improve performance by adding more complexity. And it usually costs you even more energy and you're in this loop, right? This is an example of that. Uh, you're in this vicious cycle where you want more performance. Uh, to, be, to get more performance, you want to parallelize more or tolerate the memory latency more, uh, which means that you want to start these other tasks earlier while the CPU is doing this stuff. That means that these other tasks need to be executed in some other thread or some other core. That means that you have to have that other core active and executing at the same time, which increases your energy again right, and power. Okay. And, and, and the takeaway also here is uh, PIM core and PIM accelerator uh, for compression are feasible to implement. Uh, I don't know what this, what this sentence means, but it doesn't sound right. <laughs> There's some grammar error here. <laughs> Basically, compression and grid compression are actually feasible to implement in, a, in an embedded core or an accelerator, right? That's, that's the takeaway. Of course, this depends on your compression algorithm. You may have comp complex compression algorithms, but... Uh, I think a lot of compression algorithms are doable inside memory. Okay, so uh, this is the wrap up of TAT switching. Uh, I think we've already discussed this. When you're compressing and decompressing, you cause a lot of data movement, and both functions benefit from PIM execution and be, can be implemented in the PIM logic. And you've seen already the results for compression and decompression. Right? You get about 2x, again, performance improvement. You double the performance improvement and you double the energy uh, efficiency. Okay, I mean, I can go on and on about this paper more, but. Oh, I think I'll let you read it if you're interested. But this is a, a modern case study of data movement of, on real mobile workloads. And I think it's really important. So this is, this is actually one of, the reason, one of the reasons why we did the study is this is really an adoption issue in the end, right? We could do all of these re experiments that on, on benchmarks that we may have access, but these were workloads that we could get a lot better access internally together with Google. And they're, they're used in real lives by real people. I think this is a, uh, doing, doing this sort of studies on real workloads is something that's really important so that, so that you can get a new technology potentially adopted into the future. Uh, so that, because you can understand the realistic benefits of what you can do in real workloads. Okay, any questions? Thoughts? Yes? If I'm not mistaken, compression and decompression algorithms should be heavily reliant on the device operations. Hmm. And could this be uh, potentially also done in the existing DRAM chips with uh, even more minimal changes, only like the, the thing without the other paper, where only a few of the coders are added, and the bit operations could be done in the existing chips? I see. Um, when you say existing chips, similar to the AMBIT paper that we discussed last time, mm -hmm. by changing the existing chips, right? Yeah, but uh. in the, the one before, I think, where the DRAM chips that are from the shelf there can actually execute bitwise operations. I see, yeah. Uh, but, but you need a little bit more than just bitwise operations, I think. Well, you, you still need shi uh, shifting, you need to do some metadata management. In compression and decompression, metadata management is actually not so easy. Yeah, I so I think it's not as simple as some of the other things that we talked about for bitwise operations. But certainly a lot of the algorithms still use bitwise operations. Yeah. 
And I think if you, if you really want to use bitwise operations, probably you may want to rethink your compression algorithm so that yeah, like you can design a compression algorithm that can take advantage of those bitwise operations, right? Exactly. Maybe a compression algorithm could be equally, equally good just relying <coughs> solely on the bitwise operations we can do parallels quickly. In the exactly, network. exactly. So that's, uh, that's a good way of thinking. If you, if you have a, a hardware that's capable of something that's really fast, uh, that you can do really fast, how can you redesign your algorithm? to fit that hardware. So there, there, there's this argument. What is the right thing to do? Do you fit the form to the function or the function to the form? Right. In this case, form is the hardware itself and function is what you're trying to execute. Do you want to fit your function to the hardware or do you want to fit your hardware to the function? I think both ways are important because in real life you see both cases, right? You, you're given some hardware, a GPU. Now how do you fit your function to the GPU? Right. You need to rewrite, rethink your algorithm. And in some cases, you're given some reconfigurable hardware that exists. Now, how do you fit your function to the form? It's a, now, how do you fit your form, hardware, to the function in that case, right? Basically, because you can, you can really morph the hardware in that case. But I like thinking about both ways. I, I don't take sides on that issue. <laughs> I th because in the short term, uh, you, you're given some hardware and you need to fix it. And in the long term also, maybe there's some hardware that people imagine and that comes, comes on and you'll have to use that hardware, right? So it's really important to think about algorithms that can take advantage of that hardware. And I like thinking about bitwise operations, actually. It's, I think it's a very simple hardware. And people do it today in, in some uh, cases. For example, uh, encryption and decryption is something that's really important in many applications and people want to make it extremely efficient and fast. And uh, some encryption algorithms take uh, a lot of time, but people also design encryption algorithms to be much more efficient, especially in some of these devices that don't have a lot of energy. Uh, uh, and they, they, what they do is basically they simplify the encryption algorithm as much as possible, potentially giving up some security properties. This also exists. And as a result, those algorithms become much simpler to implement. Uh, I mean, they don't execute an Mbit like, but uh, they, they, do, they do a lot of bitwise operations also. Okay, any, qu any other questions? That's a very good question. Okay, so let's move on. So uh, I'll give you some examples of other ways of taking advantage of 3D stacked memories. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, detail in a lot of them, but uh, these are some of the works that we have done also, basically. This is, a, this is an example work that I mentioned earlier. Basically, you could, uh, GPUs are very heavily limited by memory today, and we also wanted to examine how can you distribute the computation uh, from a main GPU to simpler GPUs in logic layers. This main GPU is clearly very much bad with bottleneck because you have a lot of computational power. Ideally, you would like to execute more compute intensive part of, parts of your GPU program over here, but more data intensive part of your GPU program over here. Then the, then the question is very similar, right? How do you partition your GPU kernels or GPU applications between this main GPU and uh, the GPUs that you have in the logic layers of these chips. Again, you, you, could, you could have the programmer do it, but in this work we actually wanted to understand how, how, how effective a GPU compiler could be to do it, and we actually worked with NVIDIA to look into how to do that. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this, this work proposes a compilation mechanism that goes through uh, the GPU application and figures out which parts, which blocks of the GPU application would benefit from offloading to these simpler GPU execution units that you can implement in the logic layer. The trade-off is you have a lot of computational power here. The GPU execution units can be very wide and very powerful, but they're limited by memory bandwidth and they're far away from memory. So you want to actually keep the compute intensive parts over here, whereas the ex uh, execution units that you can put into the logic layer cannot be as powerful over here because of heat and thermal limitations. But you can still put some simple execution units over here and uh, they can still have very high bandwidth and low latency access to the logic layer. Right. Okay, and this work proposed basically compiler pass that looks at which parts of the program are bottlenecked by data movement and offloads uh, those parts to the logic layer. Of course, it doesn't do only that. Uh, it's not, uh, offloading is just part of it. But the data mapping is also important because for example, if your program is adding A, B, and putting the result into C, if A is here, and B is here, and C is here, then 
it doesn't make sense to offload to the logic layer, right? And this is a fundamental problem, which is a data mapping problem. Uh, so this work proposed a way of mapping data such that the likelihood of A, B, and C being here is maximized. I'm not going to go into that in detail. There, there are a lot of other things that you need to consider, of course, right? For example, the compiler tell, may tell you, please offload this block to the logic layer. But you may not want to really do that because there might be something else executing in that logic layer. Right? So a compiler really is providing you a hint that it may, you may benefit from executing this part of the program in the logic layer. But the decision really needs to be done at runtime while the program is executing because the runtime is... Uh, the runtime system is what really knows whether it's a really good idea to offload because something else may be executing over here and if you offload, it, offload this code over here now you actually overload the computational capacity uh, of the logic layer. Right? You may actually lose performance if you do that offloading at that point. So there, uh, really the entire stack needs to be involved. Compiler, potentially the programmer helps but in this case we didn't look at that but the compiler uh, provides the offloading candidates Runtime system, when the time comes, uh, decides to offload. And there is also a memory allocation mechanism. And the memory allocator decides what pieces of data should be mapped where. So that you can maximize the efficiency of offloading. Right. Okay, so it's, it's a complex system in the end. right? And you need to really solve all of these issues if you want to make it work. And these are all adoption issues, as we will also discuss. But I'm, I'm just building up to that right now. Okay. If you're interested, you can read these papers, but I'm not going to talk about this one for sure. But there are other issues related to uh, processing in memory in GPUs. I may later talk about this one if we actually have time, because I think this is really important. Uh, one of the things that, are, that is really hard to improve performance in existing workloads is linked data structures. If you're doing pointer chasing, for example, in a B tree or any kind of tree, or a linked list, which is simpler than other structures, uh, then you're really traversing pointers, and that's really a dependent operation, right? To, to be able to get the address of uh, a node, you need to know the address of the previous node, and there's a data dependent calculation that, requires, uh, that, you, that is required to do, which means that you're very much latency bottlenecked. If you really want to speed this up, you want to reduce the latency of each memory access as much as possible, right? Because the memory, uh, you need to do a memory access to get the address of the next node, because that's where the pointer is stored, right? And people have really tried to overcome the, uh, this latency effect of pointer chasing with many, many creative mechanisms over decades and decades. Uh, and for example, people have proposed caching pointers, having a huge pointer cache inside a processor. I think it's an interesting idea, but it's, it's not very easy to do because that pointer cache in the end needs to be very large. Like if you have a huge data structure that you're traversing, let's say, I don't know, one million entries, uh, if you don't want to get any misses, all of your pointers need to be cached over there, which means that you need to cache one million pointers in a cache, right? And if you want to build a specialized cache for that, that's going to be a lot of cost. But people have tried a lot of mechanisms to be able to do that. Uh, uh, in this case, we looked at... Uh, uh, since this is a very much latency bound operation, does it really make sense to uh, do this traversal in memory? For example, your caches are not effective, your data structure is very large, and you really want to determine the address of the next node that requires a round trip to memory. And every time you traverse a node, you really need to do that round trip. And that leads to significant performance loss. But if you actually offload the linked list traversal or the data structure traversal to the logic layer, and the logic layer does the traversal internally, then the length of that or latency of that uh, loop, meaning determining the address of the next node, is much lower. Then the key question is how do you design that accelerator? How do you handle issues like virtual memory, which is also interesting, which is an adoption issue. And this paper tries to uh, take a step in that direction. And it shows that there are significant benefits if you actually offload pointer chasing uh, in real database applications, for example, because databases uh, uh, some of the databases use BP plus trees, for example, and you do a lot of pointer chasing. Okay, any questions? Okay, there are a lot of interesting ideas in this direction, I think. This is one, I think this is one of the toughest problems, pointer chasing. Ideally, you don't want to write your programs with pointers, I think, <laughs> and not, not chase pointers, but in many cases, you end up uh, doing that. Okay, this is another uh, work that actually tackles a similar problem in a different way. Basically here, uh, we, the programmer actually offloads the pointer chasing code. Here we want to do it completely transparently to the programmer actually. You have some code that's running, 
uh, in the processor, can you completely transparently in hardware, not compiler here, in hardware, figure out these dependent cache misses and figure out which code actually needs to be executed to generate those dependent cache misses and offload that code to the memory controller such that the memory controller does that traversal itself. So in the end, this adds up a lot of complexity into the hardware because you need to have a hardware mechanism to identify the, uh, what are the instructions that are doing these dependent cache misses, the traversals, let's say. And that, that identification hardware is not simple. But in the end, the benefits are actually significant over here. You get about 40 to 50% performance benefits on the applications that, that have a lot of dependent cache misses. Clearly, if you don't have dependent cache misses, it's not going to help you. Right? Okay. I like this one. We may talk about this one also, but uh, this is actually a latency tolerance. So this, is, this is using uh, the logic layer. Uh, I, I mean, this doesn't talk about the logic layer. It used, talks about the memory controller. But this is using uh, the memory controller to accelerate not an application, but accelerate the uh, prefetching mechanisms. So the idea is actually uh, stri uh, look at the program and find out the parts that are going to uh, po potentially bottleneck you in the future and identify those parts and offload them to the memory controller such that the memory controller goes through those parts, runs ahead, and generates requests to memory. And those requests are treated as prefetches. And when the core gets to that part of the program, uh, hopefully the data that's needed at that point in time by the core is already prefetched by the memory controller into the caches. That's the idea. If it's not clear at this point, don't worry. But you can, you can see that once you have uh, execution capability in the memory controller or logic layer, you can have a lot of creative ideas as to what to do with that execution capability. You don't necessarily need to partition your application. You can actually say, my application is still running in the core, but I'm doing prefetching in the memory controller, and the memory controller is automatically filling the caches such that I'm not, go uh, such that I'm not going to miss in the caches when I really need that data in the application. Right. That's the idea. And I like this one because this actually builds on my PhD thesis itself, which was on runhead execution. And that was written in 2006, and Milad actually extended to the next step, uh, which I believe is the right step, basically. Uh, in my PhD thesis, I did this runhead execution inside the core. When the core is stalled, you actually keep going and keep executing instructions, and those instructions pref provide prefetches into the core. And when the data comes back, the core continues. And when it actually gets to those instructions, it doesn't miss in the caches because it's already uh, kind of run, ran ahead and figured out what, what data it needs as opposed to stalling. But here, you don't do it in the core, you do it in the memory controller. And I think, as a result, this is more powerful because core is potentially stalling, but hopefully not stalling. The idea is, while the core is uh, uh, doing, executing the program behind, uh, the memory controller is executing the program in a later point, such that when the core gets to some load or store, uh, this, uh, the memory controller already uh, prefetched the data uh, or cache blocks that are needed by the load or store, and the core never needs to stall in the ideal case, of course. right? So in that sense, it's more powerful. You're kind of parallelizing the program such that the main program is executing over here, and a prefetch version of the program is executing in the memory controller. So there are a lot of interesting ideas, I think. And uh, actually, there, 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 there are even more interesting ideas that were developed in the 1990s, but this is a much more simple version uh, of the ideas. Okay, any questions? I think this is the beauty of being a computer architect. You can imagine, <laughs> and you can never know when something like this will, will become real. Okay, so let's, uh, let's now move into this one. So all of these are examples of offloading some sort of function to the memory controller. In this case, the function is prefetching. It's not a real function, a program, it's a speculative function that you offload that is useful for helping the performance of the program. Right? In this case, it's a real function that's discovered by the hardware. In this case, it's a real function that the programmer says, OK, this is a pointer chasing function that I offload to the memory. And we can go back, and those are all real functions. right? Which is this part, by performing simple function offloading. But can we be even simpler? That's the, other, uh, that's the next question. Simple function offloading still has its problems, right? Somebody needs to figure out the functions. Uh, you still need some full execution capability of those functions. And the functions may be complex, as we've seen. Like the deblocking filter, which we didn't talk about, is a relatively complex. Motion estimation is relatively complex functions. Can we be even simpler? 
Also, we didn't even talk about the virtual memory part, which is the hairy part, right? So if you, for example, offload a function, and if you have virtual addresses generated by that function, what do you do? You don't have a TLB in the memory controller. You don't have a TLB uh, or, or translation mechanism in the logic layer. How do you handle that? Well, actually, all of these works handle that by adding a small TLB into the memory controller. So you really need to add even more complexity than what I described. If you read the papers, you'll find out. And actually, all of those works add a small cache to the memory controller also because there's, there's still very good locality in those parts of the programs. And you don't want to really go to the memory every time. If you have good locality, add a cache to the processor that is in the logic layer, for example. Does that make sense? The same principles can apply, actually. If you're building a cache right now, if you build a processor that's close to memory, you may still need that cache. Why? Because the memory latency is still so high, uh, still quite high, and if you don't want to pay that cost of long latency. Having a small cache over there actually helps you. The cache hierarchy that you build in, uh, into the processors that are close to memory are actually not, is, not, uh, is actually not as complicated as the cache hierarchy that you build in a processor today. So that's the good part. You can get away with a 16 kilobyte or a 32 kilobyte cache, for example. Okay, but there is complexity in these. The key question is, can we actually get rid of that complexity as much as possible? What is the minimal thing that we can do uh, to take advantage of uh, processing in memory with minimal changes to the system, with minimal changes to the program? Any thoughts? If you were given this task, you have this uh, logic layer, what is the minimal thing that you can do to get some benefit, but we don't want anything, almost any changes. Yes? You can go back to setting bits. Say it again? To setting bits. To setting bits. Okay. Yeah. I think that is a minimal that you can get. Well, what do you mean setting bits? Like clearing some sort of memory. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's like zeroing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think uh, uh, that, that is true. Uh, but can you be more general purpose than that? <laughs> So we still want, we want, we want actually some general purpose. So if you look at this function of floating, it's relatively general purpose, right? Any, any program has some sort of functions. So our goal was to be more general purpose here. <laughs> any thoughts? I'll give you the idea and it'll be obvious after that probably. <laughs> because I think it's obvious. Maybe in hindsight, but maybe it was always obvious to us when we first started looking at it. You don't want to take another shot. You'll be disappointed if you didn't take the shot. <laughs> he took the shot, that's good. <laughs> Anyone else? What would you do that's minimal? We do it all the time today. You take a code, the compiler compiles it to instructions, right? Basically, the idea is to add instructions that can be executed in memory. It's a very simple idea. Okay, so let's take a look at the idea. That's, it's called PIM-enabled instructions, basically, processing in memory-enabled instructions. Uh, so let me give you the ideas. The goal was, as I said, we want to develop mechanisms to get the most possible out of near data processing with minimal cost, minimal change to the system, and no changes to the programming model. Basically, we don't want even people, we don't want people to even think about function offloading. And the idea is very simple, basically. Expose a processing in memory operation as an instruction. An instruction is by nature very similar to any other instruction that you have in the system. By nature, it uses virtual addresses, uh, it is cache coherent, and we also add this restriction, it operates on a single cache block. You will see why this is important, because cache block resides in a single memory module. Whenever you offload that instruction, you offload it to the memory module that hosts the cache block, and you, you, by nature of the instruction, you eliminate the data mapping problem. Right? You never run into the case that this instruction operates on two cache blocks, and two cache blocks happen to be in two different memory controllers. By restricting the instruction to operate on a single cache block, you guar you're guaranteed that that's not going to happen. Right? Of course, your performance improvement is going to reduce. Right? So that's the idea, basically. For example, this uh, programmer or the compiler can do this. Right? Let's assume that you're the programmer. You can say, oh, I think this instruction may be a good idea uh, to potentially execute in memory. And this is a page rank update, if you remember uh, those co that code. And the compiler or the assembly programmer converts it to this sort of instruction. 
Make sense? We'll see an example. Basically, what, what are the benefits of this? There is no change to the sequential execution programming model. It's just another instruction. That instruction can be executed in the processor if you don't have a processor that's capable of shipping to memory. Or, if it makes sense, the instruction can be executed in the memory side. No changes to virtual memory because when you fetch the instruction in the, prog uh, in the processor, you're going to translate the addresses. And the processors already have mechanisms to, for virtual to physical address translation. Minimal changes to cache coherence, actually almost no change to cache coherence, we will discuss that. When this instruction is shipped to memory, you basically need to lock the memory location so that no one else actually uh, operates on it. And there's no need for data mapping, as, as we've discussed. Each permeable instruction is restricted to a single memory module in this case. But of course, this is not enough. Once you have an instruction like this, the, the key question quickly comes up. Where do you execute this instruction? Do you execute in the processor, or do you execute on the memory side? And this is really the runtime decision. And this is another adoption issue. But if you have an instruction, the adoption issue is a lot easier. Right? So there's another key idea in this work that basically dynamically decides, there's a mechanism that dynamically decides where to execute this PEI based on simple locality characteristics and simple heuristics. So you can, for example, check a table and the table says this instruction is not in the cache. It could actually be a potential cache access, but you want to do it earlier than a cache access. Basically this table quickly gives you an indication of whether you're going to hit in the cache or not hit in the cache. And if you're not going to hit in the cache, you'd better ship it to memory. Uh, ship, uh, execute the instruction on the memory side, right? Because you don't have good locality. Of course, you can make this mechanism more sophisticated. Does it sound reasonable in hindsight? It's not very hard, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, basically, the key idea is to execute each operation at the location that provides the best performance. So, so let's take a look at the benefits of this. So we, we, uh, now you know this code relatively well. This is PageRank again, or the core of PageRank. You basically update uh, the rank with the value of the neighbors. Uh, and if you want to do this operation today, today you need to bring uh, the next rank into the processor and write it back after that, assuming you have not, go not good locality, which is the case in all of these graph applications. And this means that you basically bring in 64 bytes and write back 64 bytes. Now the idea is to convert this to a pin at, and you do the in-memory addition, with a simple functional unit over there. You don't need an execution engine, it's just a simple functional unit. And that's the pim add. What you need to do is, if, it's, if this is executed in memory, you just need to send the value to main memory. And that's just 8 bytes communication. So if this works as I described, you reduce your bandwidth requirement by 16x, right? from 128 bytes to 8 bytes. Okay, And that's where the benefit comes from. Of course, the key question is, does it really make sense to do it always in memory? And the answer is no. Uh, and this is an experiment that we've done with uh, many graphs. And these are the graphs that are smaller. These are the graphs that are much larger. And it turns out, uh, if you actually always execute these instructions that we determined, again, are good to uh, insert into the programs, if you always execute those instructions in memory, for these graphs, you lose performance. For these graphs, you gain performance. Here, you gain performance because you reduce the memory bandwidth and you do in-memory computation, and your locality is not very good. But here, these graphs actually fit in your caches uh, because they're relatively small graphs. And in those cases, caching is very effective. So if you always sh ship the data into the memory, then you don't get a lot of benefit. Make sense? Or ship the computation memory, you don't get a lot of benefit. In fact, you lose performance. So ideally, you would like to uh, gain performance across the board, right? And these, 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 actually, these applications also have some parts where you have some locality in the uh, graph traversal, and sometimes caching is effective here as well. Overall, you gain performance, but you could gain even more performance if you have a better decision mechanism. That's the idea. Okay, so this is the example of permeable instructions. Uh, and again, you need a synchronization mechanism, right? Because these permeable instructions uh, you, you send the instruction, let's say, to memory. Uh, the question is, do you wait for memory, uh, these instructions to be done before you move uh, in the code, in, in the execution of the code? And similar to fences that you have in code today, uh, we add a fence over here, a pin fence, which, which basically means that uh, when you get to this fence, you should make sure all of the operations that are sent to memory are complete. And then you can move on executing the code. 
care, you don't care because you're really sending these operations to different elements and the programmer knows that. But at this point, you may actually uh, need to do something that, ha that requires dependence, right? You really want all of those values to be, all of those ex uh, operations to be done. Okay. This is very similar to other memory ordering that you need in processor set, which we will also talk about actually later on. Okay, so then the, then, then the other key question. So this is the programming model, basically, which is very similar to today's programming model. You just add another instruction, and you need to use fences. Then the key question is, what are the instructions? Now, that's, this is where the tough part comes in, actually. First of all, who decides the instructions? Is it the ISA designer? Or do you have, actually, a somewhat configurable ISA where the user actually defines the instructions? And I think, going forward, those are actually really important because it's very hard for people to imagine all of the inst possible instructions that can be executed in memory. As you can see, these are the instructions that we came up with. And clearly, a lot of them don't exist in ISAs as instructions, right? They're more like, some of them are more like functions. For example, the dot product is clearly used by machine learning applications or matrix multiplication applications. Even though that's, it's a relatively small dot product, you can see that the input is 32 bytes and output is 8 bytes. Still, it's very useful in some applications. And these are the applications that we examined, and you will see that. Euclidean distance computation is another instruction that we thought would be useful in especially streaming data analytics. You have a lot of data that's coming in, and you want to compare that data to something. You basically look at the distance. You do a mathematical distance computation between the data and the value that you're comparing to, right? The stream cluster application is essentially a streaming analytics application. It clusters the data while the data is coming in. So it's a real-time application. And that's a useful instruction. Histogram bin index, hash table probing, these are uh, things that are used in, uh, like hash table probing is used in hash join and databases, for example. Histogram, whenever you're creating a histogram, having an instruction that ind uh, indices the beans, bins could be useful. As you can see, these have different input sizes and different output sizes. Uh, and floating point that is, of course, useful. And integer min. I, I'm not going to go through this. The paper has a lot of detail on this. But basically, someone needs to define the instruction. And in this case, this was our, uh, we defined the instructions based on our understanding of the workload. This doesn't mean that these are the best instructions. This means that this is our understanding of the workload. And uh, we thought they, they could be useful. There may be other instructions as well, right? This is another reason why having, a, I believe, a reconfigurable logic there is a good idea. Because some, uh, assuming that you give power to the users and the users actually can define their own instructions or the compilers can define their own instructions, then you still need to execute those instructions. First of all, you need to have an ISA, instruction set architecture, that can fluidly communicate those instructions to the hardware. And you need to have a reconfigurable layer that, you, that can implement those instructions. But I think this is a very, uh, this is an area that's, uh, that's really cool in the sense that you're really architecting the instruction set based on the applications, right? You're really customizing your instruction set to the applications in this case. Okay. Okay, I've already said this, I think. Uh, you can execute these either in the memory or in the processor. You have a dynamic decision mechanism, and we've already said that there are a lot of benefits to this instruction, as, uh, as long as you have single cache block restriction. And uh, this is something we didn't talk about, but the execution is atomic between different permeable instructions. We don't need to worry about that right now. Uh, but it's not atom atomic between uh, normal instructions. Meaning, if you want to actually order normal instructions and these instructions that are executed in memory, you really need to have a fence saying that uh, when you get to this fence, you should make sure everything else, that, uh, uh, everything that comes before that was sent to processing in memory should be done. And nothing after that should be started. Okay. Okay, I think we already said this. Uh, actually, similar restrictions exist in atomic instructions. Whenever we're doing, doing an atomic update to a memory location today, uh, you, you have a similar ret restriction. Uh, you, you cannot do an atomic update to multiple cache blocks in existing systems, unless you're using something called transactional memory, uh, which is really en enabling you to do multi-word atomic updates to different cache blocks, which we may talk about also. But if you don't know about transaction memory, don't worry about that yet. It's, a, it's implemented in ex some, some existing processors. But normally when you have an instruction, a single instruction, you don't update multiple cache blocks. You, you actually update a single cache block in the atomic. So, okay. So this single cache block restriction enables multiple things, actually. Uh, each permeable instruction goes to one memory module. Data mapping problem goes away. Uh, it's easier to support cache coherence and virtual memory because you need to do only one translation. Uh, for one cache block, uh, and you need to keep track of the cache coherence at the cache block granularity. If you're actually updating multiple cache blocks, 
now you have a problem. For example, uh, the uh, row clone paper had this problem, right? It's really operating on four kilobyte pages, whereas cache coherence is on the at the granularity of 64 byte cache blocks. You will need to ensure that all of those cache blocks are kept, kept coherent. Now you can imagine going into a coherence granularity that's at the page level, but that's not the case in existing systems. Even though there are a lot of research proposals that say you should probably do coherence at the core screen sometimes in hardware, that's not implemented in many systems today. Okay, so it's easier to support cache block level cache coherence and virtual memory if, you have, if you're operating on a single cache block. And also, you, this simplifies locality monitoring also because you can, uh, you can just look at, look at uh, the cache control logic at the cache block level and have a prediction for the data locality to decide where to execute the instruction. Any questions? Okay. I'm going into a little bit more detail, but we're going to see the results soon. Basically, we looked at this with 10 emerging up data intensive workloads, graph processing again, and machine learning and data mining. You can see the workloads. I think it's in the next slide. And we also looked at three input data set sizes because input data sets the size are important. That's also important for uh, whatever we discussed earlier, input data set size. As your input data set size grows, crossing in memory becomes much, much more powerful, actually. We didn't talk about this explicitly. We will see this explicitly over here. But uh, uh, this is true for whenever you're doing function offloading as well. So the function offloading results that we've shown you, uh, I've shown you earlier, you get about 2x performance improvement, let's say. That performance improvement actually increases if your input data size is huge, because you really uh, overwhelm the memory bus if, you're, if, you're, if your function is operating on a huge input data set size. Okay, so we do simulation. Uh, of course, this is changing a lot in the system. Even though it's a simple idea, you really need to add the instructions, right? Uh, and this, this leads to significant performance improvement and energy reduction, as we will see in a little bit. So basically, the takeaway is, with large input data sets, you get about 47% speed up. And this is really 47%, so it's not an execution time reduction. <laughs> this is really the performance improvement. So it's not 2x, it's really 47%. So as you can see, it's less than what we've seen so far. But it's also causing minimal changes to the system, hopefully. Okay, and the energy reduction is also pretty reasonable. But it's less than what we've seen before. Okay, these are some of the workloads. You can read the paper for more detail, but some of the things that we've seen already. Uh, okay. So let's take a look at the large input data sets. These, these are the large input data sets, and I'm showing two bars over here, processing in memory only. So basically, somebody determined the instructions. These are the PIM enabled instructions in my program, and they're always executed in memory. So you get significant performance improvement in this case. If you actually have a decision mechanism that decides, that tries to intelligently decide uh, where to execute that instruction, you get a little bit more. This is geometric mean, by the way. It's the average uh, improvement. But you can see that the decision mechanism is not always correct. In most cases, it improves performance. But in some cases, it's not as it actually reduces performance compared to executing that instruction always in memory. I mean, this may happen, right? You may actually have the instruction in the cache, and you, can, you, you decide that, okay, I should execute this operation in the cache. But later, you may actually need to flush that location into the memory, so maybe you should have done it earlier, right? You may actually increase the data volume slightly, uh, because your uh, mechanism doesn't, have it, doesn't make the right decision. But it's not a lot, so you can always improve the mechanism. In this case, for example, you get even more performance improvement over here. Okay. Uh, and you can examine this on your own. So if you look at small inputs, the story is very, completely different, as we've discussed. These are inputs that fit into the cache of the processor, and shipping these instructions, primitive instructions to memory, always to memory, actually loses performance, as you can see. This is an anomaly over here, because you have a lot of random access, and your caches are not very effective, actually. That's why you actually gain performance in this case. Uh, but here you can see that most of the time you lose performance. So if you actually have a decision mechanism that decides whether you should execute uh, in the processor or in memory, you basically curb those performance losses. You don't lose performance anymore. Yeah, you don't gain as much also. Right? That's the idea. But small input data sets are usually easier to handle anyway. Right? The difficulty is really when you have huge data sets, input data sets. Okay, now, uh, okay, you can read that on your own also. The, uh, the other interesting part is medium input data sets, meaning these are data sets don't, that don't fully fit into the caches. They somehow trash the caches, but they still fit most of the time, or uh, they still have good locality. Right? They're not as huge as 
the previous ones that overwhelm the cache hierarchy completely. You can see that if you execute always in memory, in some applications you don't gain that much. Sometimes you lose a little bit. In some applications you gain reasonably a lot. Uh, but you actually have, if you actually have a decision mechanism, here the decision mechanism is very effective. You can see that in these applications where you don't gain a lot, you actually start gaining a lot. Well, a lot for the definition of a lot here is more than 10%, right? It's not the 13x kind of a lot. Because we're not changing the system significantly. But the decision mechanism is actually quite beneficial over here. But again, it's not perfect. You can see that in some cases, going from always executing in memory versus having a decision mechanism loses performance. Which means that there needs to be more work done to understand how to, uh, where to execute a particular instruction. And if you generalize it, a particular function as well. This is in general a difficult problem. Where to execute a particular function or instruction, you need to really determine some heuristics or algorithms uh, to understand that. And in this case, our heuristic was very, very simple. That's why it's making some mistakes, I think. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's take a look at energy also. So energy, again, it's commensurate. With small input sets, sizes, you actually increase energy if you execute everything uh, in, in memory. All of these instructions, PIM enable instructions in memory, and that makes sense because your caches are very effective, you wouldn't go to memory, but now you're always going to memory. Right? Not a good idea. But if you actually have, your de have our decision mechanism, you actually reduce energy slightly, as you can see. With medium input data sets, again, if you always execute in memory, you increase energy a little bit, but if you uh, do this decision mechanism, locality aware decision mechanism, you gain energy. With large input data sets, you gain energy even if you execute these instructions always in memory, but you gain even more energy. Uh, well, you gain energy, meaning you reduce energy consumption. <laughs> you reduce energy consumption even more if you actually uh, have, a good, have a decision mechanism like what we've implemented. And clearly there's a lot of detail in terms of how the energy breaks down in the system. But you can read the paper for that. Okay, so now let's take a look at the advantage and disadvantage of this. I think these are relatively clear right now, but this is, this is a relatively simple and low-cost approach to PIM. There's a caveat. Caveat is you need to be able to change your instruction set architecture. Right? In a sense, it, uh, that may not be easy, but if you have that flexibility, it's relatively simple. Right? Uh, there's no change to the programming model, no change to virtual memory. You're not touching that. You don't need any sort of translation structure on the memory side. All, the only thing that you need on the memory side is ex some execution units, basically. The, the execution units that can execute the instructions that you've specified. And again, if it's reconfigurable, you can reconfigure it. And it dynamically decides where to execute an instruction. So it's a dynamic decision mechanism. Of course, it has disadvantages too. Clearly, it doesn't take advantage of the uh, full advantage of the PIM potential, right? And we see that in the numbers. Uh, and especially single cache block restriction is very limiting. So if you actually could define these instructions such that they could operate on 4 kilobytes, for example, you could gain more. But now cache coherence becomes complicated, virtual memory translation becomes potentially complicated if you straddle the page boundaries especially, uh, and clearly data mapping also becomes complica complicated. Now you can restrict the 4 kilobyte to be in the single memory module, but somebody needs to satisfy that. And who satisfies that? And if they don't satisfy it, what happens? They're all problems, right? But if you ensure that there's a restriction like this and nobody needs to think about even data mapping, then this works off the bat. That's the idea over here. But clearly, if you increase the uh, size of uh, the operand, you will gain more performance. Okay. I don't know if there's any other disadvantage. I think ISA is kind of a limitation. You need to change the ISA. But I think that could actually be true in some other cases uh, when you offload instructions. Although here, you, you really need to add more instructions. Every time you want to execute something new in memory, you need to add an instruction. Right. Okay, any questions? Does this sound cool? Okay. I guess it kind of sounds cool. <laughs> Maybe not as cool as Ambit. No? This is clearly easy, easier to adopt. And also, actually, this was accepted right away. <laughs> Which means that if you're closer to the mindset of the majority of the reviewers, it's easier to get your ideas accepted. Whereas if you're proposing something totally wild, which I think Ambit gets closer to, it's easier to get that rejected, right? 
Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. Oh well. We only have 24 minutes, and I wanted to finish processing in memory today. Let's see. I think the rest uh, we're going to talk about adoption issues mostly. But I think uh, there are clearly adoption issues. Simp uh, simp uh, this is basically simplifying processing in memory. But uh, automatic code and data mapping is important. We've talked about some of these. Automatic offloading of critical code. So automating processing in memory also enables adoption. And I think some of these works are automating. And I'm, I'm not going to go through that. Cache coherence support is important. Uh, I think maybe this is a good idea to uh, talk about when we talk about cache coherence later. So I'm going to skip some of these things. This is actually relatively uh, recent work where we show that cache coherence overheads actually can uh, really uh, destroy the benefits that you get from, uh, uh, from processing in memory. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. I think we may, we may be better off talking about that when we talk about cache coherence. But this is a huge challenge and opportunity for the future, I think. Uh, how do we actually design these energy-efficient, data-centric, and high-performance, i.e. data-centric architectures? Because I think, really, if you're data-centric, if you're operating on where the data resides, you're both energy-efficient and high-performance. And that, I think, in the end, that minimizes the data moment. So let's talk about adoption issues. Let's see how much time we have. Maybe I'll talk about coherence. <laughs> have, have people studied coherence before here? Like cache coherence? Sort of. You know the problem. Basically, if the same data exists in two places, if one person updates it, and if so somebody else has a stale data now, how do you ensure that that person or the processor doesn't read the stale data? Okay, so everybody knows. Maybe we'll talk about it. But I want to make sure we don't run, run out of time. And I have a lot of slides. That's amazing. I guess this crossing in memory is something big. <laughs> okay. So uh, these are the adoption issues. Whenever you uh, think about a new technology, especially things, something that changes the paradigm, you really need to think about adoption. And this is true actually every time. Uh, you cannot really, if you want to change the world, basically, you cannot ignore the world. If the world is operating in some way, you really need to somehow figure out a path to enable that way to become your way, uh, to, or to change to that paradigm. Right? That's the idea. And this is true, actually, even big companies suffer from this. I'll, uh, I'll give you examples uh, from Intel, for example. Uh, I think I gave you this example before, but Intel, uh, when people wanted to switch from a 32-bit ISA to a 64-bit ISA in the 1990s, uh, Intel's decision was to be very radical. They wanted to actually completely change their ISA to something called IA64. ISA from the x86 ISA and that ISA has a lot of good properties it gives a lot of visibility to the compiler such that the compiler can actually schedule code uh, it can actually optimize the code uh, to the uh, underlying architecture uh, but it completely changes the ISA which means that you start with zero software base on that and the software base that you have in x86 needs to be somehow redirected to IA64 uh, it turns out, even though there was a lot of research and product development that was done in IA64, in the end, this effort didn't succeed because it was a huge adoption problem. How do you actually get the same performance that you're getting with your x86 code on this new IA64 architecture? Right? Intel provided software support, clearly, to enable that, but the x86 code that was running on the IA64 architecture was running like a dog, very slowly. You don't want that. And people needed to rewrite their programs completely uh, to actually get performance out of the i64 architecture. Right? Which means that it's very hard to move all of the software, which essentially is al almost all of the software. Right? x86 is really the dominant ISA, especially at that time. This is 1990s, when ARM was not as strong, for example. Uh, at that time, the majority of the world's code was running on x86 architecture. And you, you're basically trying to remove that x86 and replace it with some other ISA. Now everybody needs to change their code. And that didn't happen because this was a clear adoption issue. And a company like Intel couldn't pull it off, right? This Intel was very strong. Even it's strong even at this point, but it was even, more, even stronger at that time, I would argue. Uh, so what happened? Basically, uh, what happened was AMD, who proposed relatively small changes to the ar architecture, Basically, they just changed the x86 architecture, called it x86-64. They changed it from 32 bits to 64 bits, and they redefined some of the registers, etc. And everybody adopted that, because it was a lot easier to port the code. Actually, the existing code didn't have any problem, right? It would run the same on this ISA, 
And if you really wanted to go to 64 bits, you basically uh, had to go through a slightly more pain, not going, uh, but not as much pain as rewriting your program completely. Right. As a result, AMD actually uh, kind of won in the sense that everybody is using that x86-64 architecture today. <laughs> So this is a very uh, clear example adoption issue, right? Even if you may be the leading company, you may not be able to change the world to something different. Something different may be really good, actually. I really like a lot of the properties of IA64, uh, which we may talk about later on. But uh, you really need to care about adoption. I like giving another example when I talk about this one. How many of you know the, uh, the, the name Arvind? Okay, Arvind is a pioneer in Dataflow. He's a professor at MIT. And he actually uh, was one of the pioneers in Dataflow architectures. And if you took my class, you know what Dataflow is, right? Basically, you get rid of the program counter. Uh, instructions execute not based on a program order, but based on when the data is available for an instruction, right? It's basically Dataflow-based principles. Uh, somebody compiles the uh, you, you have instructions still but the order of instructions is not determined by the programmer the order of instructions is completely dynamic if the data is available if the operands are available for that instruction the processor fetches that instruction and executes it and it makes the data available for some other instruction and it fetches that instruction and the, the, the processor operates completely based on those principles now this clearly changes the ISA it enables a lot of parallelism much more parallelism than you could get with the uh, control flow based architectures, which is the von Neumann architecture. Data flow is not von Neumann. Von Neumann, by definition, is sequential instruction processing. Right? This is not sequential, this is completely parallel. Your parallelism is limited by the data dependencies in the end only. And Arwin was a pioneer, and there was a lot of work that happened uh, in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s on data flow, and people wanted to really change the world and turned into data flow. Uh, and it didn't happen, at least not in the way they envisioned it. Uh, so what happened was basically uh, people were building a lot of experimental data flow machines, but it never took off in industry. Uh, and one of the reasons, when, when Arvind, Arvind gave a keynote talk at the major conference, International Symposium on Computer Architecture in 2005, and I was a graduate student who was listening to that keynote talk at that time, and it was a beautiful keynote talk. Uh, uh, that's very insightful. But one of the key insights that I believe was one of the most important ones was that uh, he said we, sh uh, we should have focused a lot more on adoption. And adoption meant to him was we should have focused really on software. <laughs> Meaning they focused a lot on hardware and how to really get it working. But they didn't maybe have enough resources or time to focus on software. But it was really all about the moving that software to that hardware execution paradigm. Right? So it's really important to keep that in mind, right? You may design the beautiful hardware of the world, but in the end, if you ignore what's going to execute on it, you're not going to be successful. And that hardware may be a museum hardware in the end. Of course, there are hardware that is used that goes into the museum, but it may directly go into the museum in this case. <laughs> okay? So that's the idea, basically. That's why I think uh, whenever you're designing hardware changes, you cannot ignore what's, what's up uh, in the stack. I think this, this similar issues exist in programming languages, of course, right? If you propose a new programming language, you should really understand what's going on up the hardware stack. But it's not as bad in the sense that, okay, you propose a new programming language, uh, you didn't really design all of the lower layers of the stack. Hardware is very costly, right? You, like Intel poured a lot of money into IA64. And I64 lost a lot of money in the end, I think. <laughs> they could have potentially done something else, right? Of course, it's not a good mindset in the sense that I, I really admire the fact that these big companies take these big initiatives that are risky, right? Even though they fail and potentially fail in the end, right? But they had the mindset that, okay, we're going to do it. They didn't say, it's working okay. Why change, right? But of course, you always take a risk when you try to change. And the risk may be good or bad. Uh, or it may result in uh, success or failure. Okay, so that's why I think the adoption is really important, especially if you're taking a big risk uh, by changing the paradigm. So what are, what are these adoption issues? These are actually five key issues, I think. Each issue actually has multiple points, as you can see over here. And the first issue is essentially software. What are the applications 
What is the software? What is the functionality that's required by software from processing in memory? And I think this issue is really important. And then the next issue is, of course, how do you get that software to run on processing in memory? Which is, how, how do you make it programmable? What are the interfaces that you expose to the programmers such that they don't uh, start throwing their, uh, banging their heads on the walls, right? You don't want programmers going crazy. And what is the support that you have in the compiler to enable that, right? Maybe you don't want programmers to go crazy and you have compilers that handle all of the tasks and maybe libraries, right? We were discussing that yesterday. System support is also very important because this directly affects programming as well as the software complexity. Coherence, for example, if you get rid of coherence, then people need to program completely differently. That may not be a good idea. If you get rid of virtual memory, again, people have been used to virtual memory. How do you handle that? Uh, on top of that, you don't want people dealing with decisions like this. So you need to have mechanisms to enable uh, runtime and compilation systems that tell you what, where, where, where should code be executed, right? In the CPU or in the processing in memory engine. How should data be mapped? Who do you expose that to, right? Should you expose that to the programmer? Ideally, it should be transparent again, right? Or how do you handle access permissions, right? If you're actually running some code in the processing in memory engine, in the processor, you have access permissions. This is, very, this is very related to virtual memory also, right? But you need to ensure that the access permissions are also satisfied on the memory side, right? All of the security that we've been used to needs to be done. Sharing control needs to be done. Quality of service control needs to be done on the memory side also. And I think in the end, we also want the infrastructure to assess the benefits of the processing in memory and the feasibility of it, right? We really want to have mechanisms that give us good information Whenever we say, okay, we have this application, do we really get 10% or do we get 10x? Right. If you don't get these uh, things correct, this is really an adoption issue in the end because you may estimate that you're going to get 10x by moving to this technology, but in real life you may get 20% and you build all this hardware thinking that you're going to get 10x and in the end your hardware is not adopted because you're getting 20%. Right. That's the idea. That's why infrastructure is extremely important also. All of that simulation infrastructure, tool chains, they may sound boring, but they're actually, but like the simulators that you're building, they're actually important because uh, if you get those right, and if you get, assess the benefits and feasibility early on, first of all, you can speed up the development if you see a lot of benefits, and if you trust the benefits that you get, or you could cut down your losses quickly. You can say, we're not going to get a lot of benefit out of this, so let's pursue some other idea, right? That's why all the simulators or models that you build to understand what kind of benefits you get is really important. Uh, and also feasibility, right? What is the feasibility? You need to do feasibility studies. But I think all of these are well, clearly a lot, but all of these can be solved with a change of mindset. It really takes someone or some people who, who say, okay, we change the mindset, and we have the right mindset, and we want to change the world. And people have been successful that way also. Right? Dataflow actually, Dataflow is a very interesting story. Dataflow was never successful at the ISA level. But today, a lot of the FPGA programming is done in a Dataflow manner, if you will. So it was very successful in a very different domain than what people have imagined. But it was also successful in a very different way. So today, actually, if, if you've taken my course again, you know that all of the modern high-performance microarchitectures execute code in Dataflow using Dataflow principles. I say Dataflow principles because the principle is an instruction gets executed when its source operands are ready. It makes its result ready, and some other instructions become ready after that becomes, result becomes ready. So this is data flow-based principle. It's out-of-order execution. But it's a very different understanding. Uh, understanding is that uh, this is not exposed to the programmer. The pro what the programmer sees and writes is sequential execution. It's the von Neumann model. You preserve that illusion to the programmer, and the underneath, uh, in, uh, underneath the hardware executes instructions in a completely different order than the programmer specified. And you can do that as long as you preserve the order that's seen by the programmer, right? You can do any kind of trick in the microarchitecture as long as you obey the contracts that the programmer expects. So Dataflow has been extremely successful from that perspective, but it took, it took actually people who had that mindset, right? Actually, when, when, when the, this idea of taking a sequential instruction stream and converting into Dataflow principles such that you do out of order execution, when it was first proposed, uh, well, when it was first done, actually, in 1960s by IBM, it was not, in, not done in uh, a good way because it didn't preserve the sequential execution model. What it did was it reordered the instructions and it exposed that reordering to the programmer. 
where the, where, where the programmer expected that you actually programmer wrote code that's sequential, but underneath the hardware reordered the instructions for performance, and sometimes you would get results that are, that are out of order. So this is something that the programmer couldn't deal with. As a result, this project didn't succeed. So there were people actually who pushed this idea through, but it didn't work because it really affected the programmer. When it really worked in the 1980s, uh, my advisor and uh, his uh, graduate students actually proposed the model. You don't do it that way. You, what you need to do is really se preserve the sequential execution model. Meaning, the hardware still reorders the instructions to get high performance, fine, but you don't expose it to the programmer. Meaning that hardware reorders the instructions internally, and when you expose it to the software, the software gets the instructions in the original order. And that, at that point, took off in the 1980s. And, of course, there were people at Intel uh, who basically had the right mindset, saying that we're going to implement this model. And uh, that, that's uh, Pen Intel Pentium Pro was really designed from 1993 or 1992 to 1995 or 1996. And that implemented exactly those principles. They took the x86 instruction stream, they basically reordered the instructions completely internally, and, but they didn't expose that reordering to the programmer. And that was the first, uh, that was not the first, but that was the first commercially successful microprocessor that, did, that operated based on data flow principles underneath without exposing them to the programmer. And that took a really good set of determined people who, said, who had the mindset, we're going to change the world and we're going to do it this way. Okay, so I think all of these things can be done with the right mindset, but of course, this may be a bit harder than what, we, what we've been discussing. <laughs> okay, so basically I think we need to revisit the entire stack also at the same time, uh, because I think a lot of these issues really span the entire stack, like including algorithms. But again, uh, it's, a, it's a big community in terms of research, right? Uh, maybe you have some device, maybe you start designing algorithms for it. And people may actually start, uh, get, uh, take, uh, start having a lot of good use cases for different uh, types of devices once those devices appear. And again, we can get there step by step. We don't need to change everything at the same time. Right? That's why having, think, having these adoption issues is really important in mind because you can solve some of those adoption issues little by little. Pim enabled instruction is a very good example, I think. Uh, but that's one step. Then the key question is, how, uh, where do you get to from PIM-enabled instructions? Okay, so if you're interested, actually, we've, we've been writing a lot of, uh, well, several papers that talk about some of the issues that are out there uh, in processing in memory. And you may want to read this if you're interested. I'm not going to assign this one, I think. It's a relatively long one. We've covered a lot of issues in, in these lectures anyway, actually. Actually, these lectures are, this, this paper is based on the lectures that I delivered on this topic, so it's kind of like a small textbook for processing in memory. Uh, and we have a lot, uh, this is another paper that we've written actually. It's, it looks at more programming ease and workload perspectives. And this was invited to the IBM uh, Journal of Research and Development. They had a special issue. I think it still hasn't appeared, as you can see, on hardware for artificial intelligence. And they were interested in profit processing in memory, because a lot of these algorithms are bottlenecked by memory in the end, as we've seen with TensorFlow. Okay, so I think I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, but we already talked about some of these challenges. Where should code be mapped? Clearly, should it be executed here? Should it be executed here? These are challenges. Data mapping is an adoption challenge. How should your data be mapped? Uh, and we have some steps that you've taken, but there needs to be a lot more steps taken, I think, for this. Coherence is something that's important. Uh, yeah, I don't want to talk about this now because we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> So maybe we'll, uh, we'll get back to this coherence when we actually cover coherence. Uh, but this is actually one of the hairy problems. Coherence is basically existing coherence mechanisms don't uh, give you good performance if you actually partition your program between the CPU and the processing in memory. You really need some other coherence mechanism. And the question is, what is that coherence mechanism? I'll let you think about that. Why, do, why, don't, why don't existing coherence mechanisms give you much performance benefit? Because they actually cause a lot of data movement, right? If, you, if, for example, the, uh, you, you, you want to update some data value, or even you want to read some data value in the processing and memory engine, in the core over here, and you're not sure you have the up-to-date value, what do you need to do? You, a, you need to ask for permission. But to, be, to, be, to ask for permission, what do, you, what do you do? You go back on the bus, and you go to the CPU. That's a very bad idea. Right? Uh, 
essentially coherence causes this data movement to maintain coherence and we, want, we really don't want that data movement. <laughs> so you don't want to partition your program to eliminate data movement only to incur data movement for coherence. Right? You don't want that. That's, that's the fundamental problem. That's why it's not easy. But we have some mechanisms to actually uh, do this. If you're interested, I would re recommend looking into this work over here. Uh, and I have some slides, but I'm going to skip those slides. It's actually good slides, I think. Or does anybody want to go through these slides? Probably not right now. We're going to get back to it. We're going to talk about coherence later in this course. Uh, from both posture-centric perspective, and I think this is a, it's a good, uh, it will be a good time to talk about more data-centric perspective to coherence, because it's a more data-centric perspective to coherence. Okay, how do you support virtual memory? I think this is one of the hairiest issues, actually. I think virtual memory is actually a big burden in today's systems. Because if you have huge amounts of memory, do you really want to manage it at the four kilobytes inflexible page si using inflexible page sizes? This leads to a lot of metadata. And you can actually do the calculations, right? If you have, I don't know, one exabyte memory, and if you have four kilobyte pages, then the metadata that you need to keep in your page tables is huge. That's easy to calculate. Right? And that metadata leads to a lot of inefficiency because that metadata needs to go into your TLBs. Your TLBs need to be sized accordingly. It's a mess, I think. So I think people really need to rethink virtual memory uh, today, uh, especially w when we have huge size memories going into the future. Uh, and I think the page size issue is really hairy as well. People who have been using four kilobyte page sizes, at that time that was large. At, 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 uh, at some point in time it was large. Today it's extremely small, right? One exabyte memory, one exabyte is 2 to the 60, right? Four kilobytes is 2 to the 12. Essentially, you have 2 to the 48 pages in the system if you have one exabyte memory. That's a lot of metadata to keep, assuming you keep four bytes, for example, uh, in a page table entry. So people really design, didn't design virtual memory systems with what we have in mind today. And that's exactly why it needs to be rethought. Uh, but the question is, uh, so the, even in the processor-centric perspective, it needs to be rethought, I think. But uh, adding computation on the memory side adds even more challenges, as we discussed, right? You need to do the translation on the memory side. You need to do the access control on the memory side. So how do you do it? Right. And this paper is, takes one step. It basically uh, separates the virtual memory space between the CPU and the uh, uh, processing in memory side. Processing in memory side has its own virtual memory space that the CPU doesn't touch. That's the idea. I'm not sure if that's the best solution. I think this takes one step. It works for relatively small systems in my opinion. But if you want to scale this, I'm not sure if this solution actually scales really well. That's why I think there needs to be a lot more, to be, more work to be done. Of course there are other issues that I believe are also adoption issues because uh, how do you know your data structures is right? If you want to do parallel execution, for example, uh, maybe you really need to rethink your data structures as well, such that you get good parallelism from the memory. Uh, this paper is actually interesting from that perspective. It's a more theoretical paper, but I think this sort of uh, exercise is really important as well. Uh, because if your data structure, if, at least from a performance perspective, uh, let's assume that you went into the pane and parallelized your data structures, and you have hundreds of cores, and you basically partition your data structures, parallelize them, the performance that you get out of those hundreds of cores may be more than the performance that you get if you actually execute it, uh, your, 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 uh, your code uh, on the memory site. If your memory doesn't support the parallel data structures, parallelization of the data structures. That's the idea. That's why it's good to think about how do you actually parallelize the data structures inside the memory also. Okay. And also infrastructures, this is also important. At some point you may actually look at this uh, if, if, if we uh, have an assignment on processing in memory, but probably not this year. If you take the course again next year, you may actually look at processing in memory. Uh, but not this year, I think. But basically, infrastructures like this is also really important. Uh, and this is one of the infrastructures that we've released in tr uh, so that you can, people can do processing in memory studies uh, relatively reliably. And uh, it's also important to, to have uh, more analytical models for performance energy for processing in memory. I'm not going to talk about this, but this, these sort of analytical models are much faster than simulation. And as long as you can develop an analytical model that's much faster, maybe you can make some of the design choices better in, uh, for processing in memory. Okay, and we've also been working on FPGA-based uh, test beds for processing in memory, but I'm not going to talk about that at this point. 
let me skip. And then the next one is, I think, application and use cases. I think it's really important to examine application and use cases. And clearly, bioinformatics is one. And you've seen some of this in an earlier lecture. I'm not going to talk about that. That's why it's important to examine applications like this. Uh, and I think there are a lot more applications to examine. And if you're interested, you can talk with me uh, about this. Okay, so I think I already said all of this. So let me go to the more fun part of the course. Not course, the lecture. <laughs> okay. So basically, I think what we're uh, what this these three sets of lectures are about is really we're trying to enable a paradigm shift. And I think uh, until recently, I was using only these slides. So you remember we talked about these slides, right? I recommended the structure of scientific revolutions that enables a paradigm shift. I'm not going to go through this again. I think we're at the point where we're not doing normal science, normal engineering or science at this point. And uh, computer architecture because people are really examining different directions and processing in memory is something that can actually shift the paradigm in a different way and you already know that because but the good thing is I think now I also have things like this that, you ca that I can show right people are actually really trying to build uh, what we've discussed in the course of these three lectures this is an example these are actually processing in memory chips as we've discussed earlier uh, and if you look inside, even though they don't provide a whole lot of information, what you have is basically inside here, you have a very simple processor. It's not even 3D stacked. People are actually even more aggressive. They're trying to add this very simple processor inside the DRAM itself, a single DRAM chip. No 3D stacking here, no logic layer. So you can actually take this DIM and plug it into your motherboard, assuming they sell it, assuming they're successful. And you can write your applications, rewrite your applications. So there's an adoption issue over here. You will need to rewrite your application such that it fits uh, the programming model and the capabilities of the chip, uh, capabilities of the processors over here. Right? But the good thing is people are actually working on this. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so let me conclude, I think. I'm going to skip some more slides over here. But this is going to be the fun part. And I hope I won't be late to the PhD defense because my student will not be very happy, I think. <laughs> Imagine your advisor not making it to your PhD defense. Then. <laughs> okay. So if there are no questions, I'm going to conclude. But this will take some time. But that's okay. I think I, say, I still have, I have some margin. <laughs> okay, so let's conclude. I think... Uh, Basically, uh, this is a quote that I like from a famous architect. This architect says, architecture should be based upon principle and not upon president. Does anybody know who this is? No? This is Frank Lloyd Wright. He's, an Amer he's probably the most famous American architect. He's not alive anymore. But, uh, and he, he, he basically was a principled person, and he really designed principled architectures. He didn't really design something that's based on the past. He really had his own principles. And as a result, he didn't design something like this. This is something that works okay, right? Again, why change? <laughs> but he designed something like this. Well, th that picture doesn't do justice to it. This picture does a lot more justice. Does anybody know where this is? Has anyone taken an architecture course? No? If you took an architecture course, you would probably have seen a real architecture course, not the fake architecture or micro-architecture that we're doing. But in a real architecture course, uh, this is taught in real architecture courses as a, a masterpiece of this architect, basically. But also a masterpiece of overall architecture that you see in the world, especially modern architecture. But this is falling water. It's very close to Pittsburgh, where I used to teach. Uh, and essentially, uh, it's, it's an example of organic architecture, where the, this building is built on a waterfall. And it really imitates the structure of the waterfall itself. So it really blends in... Uh, that's kind of like a waterfall on top of a waterfall. <laughs> so these cantilevers actually kind of imitate these two uh, pieces. Anyway, there's a philosophy behind it. There's a uh, design principle behind it. Okay, so that's falling water. And you can see that. Uh, anyway, I think this doesn't talk about falling water. I had another slide somewhere before that talks about falling water. But this is another example, precedent-based design. This is, again, it works. It's fine, right? Why change? <laughs> and you're used to these, probably. Uh, more in Europe. Uh, it's a train station, uh, but it's not like this. This is Stadelhofen, and clearly it's based on some principle. And actually, someone today sent me an email uh, saying that they have plans to re architect the Kalatrava building in Stadelhofen. I don't know if that, that's, a, that's apparently approved. 
Uh, anyway, but that's based on some principle, and the same principle is applied to some other building over here. Uh, and the same is in Portugal, Lisbon, so those of you who are Portuguese may know this one. The same principle is applied to another building over here. This is Valencia, uh, Spain. And the same principle is applied to another building over here. This is Oculus in New York. And again, uh, this is not... Uh, these people actually had the mindset to change completely. They didn't say, I'm not going to change, I'm going to do the same thing again. That's why they revolutionized the world. Right? But the revolution came at a cost. This is Santiago Calatrava, who's an ETH alumnus. Uh, so the revolution came at a cost. Right? As we discussed, this is $4 billion for the New Yorkers. <laughs> and this is also costly. Actually, even Stadelhofen was costly when it was built. This was his first major assignment, if you will. His first major architectural task. Uh, so these came at a cost. Actually, the, the building that I showed you, falling water itself, uh, it came at a cost also. And as we discussed, cost is always an issue. But again, this is, I think this is very natural. If you want to change something to a new paradigm or new design, you have to bear the cost. It's not going to, uh, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be zero cost. Right? If it were zero cost, everybody would be doing it. This is also interesting, right? If 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 you have them, uh, usually people say, "But this is costly." Actually, but this is costly is one of those bullet points that I showed you in that book, right? Well, yes, it's costly because you're changing the paradigm, right? But now nobody cares about the cost, right? People go into falling water; they actually enjoy it. Actually, it's uh, it probably uh, already uh, made up for the cost when it was being built. They said, architect, you're not supposed to do anything else into the building. Get out. Thank you. Because we don't, we're not paying you anymore. Right? Same thing happened kind of here also. Uh, but now, a lot of these buildings actually overcome their cost. So it's really good to think about uh, new technologies that way. Right? Or new paradigms that way. Yes, it may be a humongous cost. But you're not doing it for just today. You're really going to overcome... Uh, or amortize that cost over decades and decades, hopefully. And you move to a much better place, hopefully. So this, uh, probably, I would argue that the world is a much better place because of this, right? Or because of Stadelhofen, because uh, if Stadelhofen wasn't there, I, I, I couldn't have another example. Right? Because all of these other train stations are very similar. But it provides something else that all of those other stations cannot provide, right? That's true over here. People go inside this and look with awe into the building, right? That's something that you can put a value on potentially, right? But they don't care about the cost in the end. Because the cost is being amortized. Actually, I was in Beijing teaching uh, some, uh, some of these lectures over there. Uh, uh, I think it was at the end of August. At the end of August, uh, I, went, uh, I went to the Olympic Stadium for the second time. And uh, there's a big stadium over there. It's called Bird's Nest. And that was extremely costly also. Uh, I, actually, it was built by some Swiss architects. I think Herzog and Müller. Uh, they built it. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what kind of controversy it caused at that time. Probably not as much in China. <laughs> because China sometimes uh, takes the mindset. They have the mindset to, we're going to do it, and they will do it. <laughs> I think that mindset is actually very interesting. Uh, but they, they actually told me that uh, the building already made up for its cost since 2008. It was built for 2008 and they said it was costly but it already made up for its cost because so many people visited it. Right. So it's always good to think about a new technology that way. New technology may look very costly but if it has benefits especially if it has large benefits like what we've discussed it's really important to discount that cost a little bit and of course somebody needs to invest in that cost right? somebody needs to actually bear that cost initially but the understanding should be that if this is successful you will actually make up for, it, for that cost over time. And hopefully, you will get to a much better place where things are much more energy efficient, sustainable, and high performance, right? In the case of processing in memory. So I liken processing in memory to these buildings, or any new technology to these buildings. And that's the principle over here. So uh, as we conclude, I will also ask, what, like, what, what is the overarching principle for computing? I don't claim that I know the overarching principles, but I know that it's not a, it's not a single principle. We've been treating computing as processor-centric for a really long time. And we're not thinking about some other principle. Well, we're thinking about it, but we've not enabled it yet. I think a data-centric computing is probably more similar to what we have over here, right? Data-centric, distributed, 
even though we don't quite understand exactly how human brain works, and even though we don't necessarily want to imitate it, we may want to imitate some things that it does, right? Like, uh, I look at these neural networks, uh, it's not clear if they actually operate based on the principles that we have in our own brain, right? Like, if, if uh, as a human being, uh, once you see a horse, you can recognize a similar horse later on, right? You don't need hundreds of millions of horse pictures to really understand that something is a horse. And even then, the neural network may make mistakes, right? But as a human being, we're a lot more efficient in identifying some things. Right? So that, I think, fundamentally indicates to me that some of these things that we're building are really not, don't, don't at least have the principles that we have much more efficiently. Anyway, I think basically overarching principle of computing, I don't think it's just a single principle. There should be probably multiple principles, but I think data centricity is probably one of them over here. So let me conclude with that in mind. I think basically this lecture, this series of lectures on processing in memory is, a, is all about principled system architectures to solve the memory problem. Because memory problems are affecting the energy efficiency, performance, and sustainability in the end. And I think we need to really design complete systems to be balanced, high performance, energy efficient, which means that they need to be data centric. And I think this requires enabling computation capability inside and close to memory. And I think uh, hopefully I've shown you a lot of examples where this can lead to orders of magnitude improvements in different ways. I believe this can enable new applications and computing platforms. Remember the bioinformatics discussion that we had? These platforms that don't exist, they're all heavily bottlenecked by data. And enable better understanding of nature. And even self-driving cars, I think. They, if, if we really need to be successful over there, we need to be a lot more data-centric, probably. And probably enable a better understanding of nature as well, because probably nature is really operating on some more data-centric principles. Right? Actually, this is really interesting. I, uh, one of the uh, things that I studied during my undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan was psychology. I, I was fascinated by psychology, so I did a dual degree in psychology and computer engineering. And... Uh, at that time, uh, uh, the paradigm in psychology was really all about computing. Basically, people were fascinated and uh, people wanted to uh, use computers as a blueprint for understanding why human, humans do the things they do. So it was really, the paradigm in psychology was computing as a way of understanding humans. But that paradigm, I think, failed right now. I don't know if anyone teaches that that way, because I think that was not successful because understanding the computers really didn't lead to much about understanding the humans because computers don't really operate the way we do, I think. Uh, as a result, I don't think we were very successful in the processor-centric paradigm to understand the nature. But if you look at some other types of paradigms, for example, like neuromorphic computing that tries to imitate how brains potentially work, that may enable a better understanding of the nature also because you iterate, uh, you build the computers based on the principles that you think humans are designed with, uh, or humans evolved into, uh, uh, and you actually, or not just humans also, right, any kind of life potentially, uh, and then you actually use that to really feed into the observations to neuroscience, for example, and that may actually lead to a better understanding of the nature, and that may lead to a better loop. Right? Okay, anyway, we can talk more about this, but there may be other things also that we are not catching clearly. But clearly, this is not easy. There are a lot of challenges, but I think the future is really bright. Uh, but we need to really think across the stack. And hopefully these lectures kind of stretch your mind to think a little bit more across the stack over here. I wish I could do, talk to the electrons also and figure out how to make them more data-centric. But maybe they are fundamentally data-centric. I don't know. Okay, anyway, joke, uh, jokes aside, uh, I think any new technology will uh, have resistance. And that's very clear, as you've seen in some of the examples that I gave you. But other uh, technologies that have had a lot of resistance have been successful. So there are good examples also. I've given you bad examples, like IA64, for example, that were not successful. Dataflow had successful in a very different way. But there are some technologies that have been extremely successful, and flash memory is a very good example of it. Initially, flash memory was a very doubtful emerging technology. People were actually doing research in flash memory since 1970s, actually, 19, late 1960s also. But in 1980s, 1990s, people were talking about how to actually enable this technology, some people, a small set of people, I would say. And, for example, I had friends who were writing proposals to the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Uh, in 1990s saying, I want to do 
uh, research on garbage collection flash memories. And they would be getting rejections very similar to what we've seen, saying, who cares about this technology? It, there's not even a working example of it. Again, this is another example of, it doesn't exist, why change, right? <laughs> Uh, but this clearly flash memory has been extremely successful and this, uh, I think uh, these things are uh, there because we have flash memory, right? Otherwise, where would we store our pictures and waste a lot of memory? <laughs> anyway, but basically this memory was enabled because of a lot of research that was done. And I was recently at the Flash Memory Summit uh, giving a presentation and Flash Memory Summit every year uh, uh, has this display uh, talking about what happened in flash memory over a timeline. And you can see that there's not much activity over here from 1967. People really didn't believe in the technology, but some people had the mindset to believe in the technology and they actually enabled all of this, meaning flash memory is everywhere in our lives, right? I believe that it's a technology that has actually revolutionized our lives, right? Because I can carry this laptop much better with flash memory in it. I can have something like this with flash memory in it also. The form factors are reduced significantly. So basically there are technologies that were resisted very heavily, but people put in a lot of cost into this, right? Uh, so it's, it's always good to think about uh, uh, different technologies and how they evolved. Flash memory had very different challenges than processing in memory. So it was always a storage technology. People never considered changing the paradigm uh, for it people thought about it as a storage technology, but its manufacturing challenges were humong humongous. Basically, you need to have a completely different manufacturing technology to enable this. So there was a lot of cost associated with it, and some people bore that cost, and as a result, they were successful. Uh, in processing in memory, I think manufacturing, manufacturing challenge is not as bad. Manufacturing is not as hard, in my opinion, in processing in memory. We already, we already can do 3D stacking. In flash memory, system level challenges were not as bad. Because you use this as a storage device, right? You take out hard disks, you plug in flash memory, and hopefully it works. Maybe it's not the best way of using flash memory, and people actually figure out that it's not the best way, because hard disks are high latency, flash memory is lower latency. If you actually do better optimization, you can actually get much better performance out of your flash memory. But still, you don't need to completely change the paradigm. I think the more bigger difficulty in processing in memory is not in manufacturing, which is really bad in flash technology, but uh, it's really in the system level challenges like we talked about, those across the stack challenges. Flash memory didn't have that, but processing memory actually has that. Arguably that's a much bigger challenge, but I think that's a challenge that needs to be solved. If you want to learn more about other challenges, I think it's here, but I think I've, covered, I've done a good job covering a lot of them. Okay, this is probably a good place to end the processing in memory lectures. Any questions? I know I, I, I thought uh, I thought I would not keep you until three twenty, but sorry. <laughs> okay, I guess if there are no questions, then we'll see each other next week. Hopefully, you'll digest a little bit more of this, and have a good weekend.